of practice. Cliff Matthews requested a Cyrus Power Budget video. So, um, the Power Budget videos, things that I've been doing, uh, it's been a little while since I've done one now, but basically, I'm going to look at the kit, and to the best of my ability, I'm going to look at it in a vacuum. I'm just going to take this card, take, take this deck apart and go, alright, as a character kit, what do I see? Never mind how many times I've played the character, never mind what I'm thinking about, or what the meta is, what the strats are, just looking at these cards on paper, what do I see, what do I think? Um, and in particular, where does the power budget lie? How strong is this? What's important to this character? So, without further ado, uh, let's grab us a Cyrus reference and see what we're doing. Doop. Okay. Uh, we will open with the character ability. After resolving an instant boost, put it into play as a face time continuous boost that reads hit at this card to your gauge. Um, okay. So yeah, you basically can you can get gauge out of your instant boost, but conditionally, right? You still have to hit with your next attack. That's still pretty good. You know, you, you are converting what would be discarded cards into gauge instead. Yeah, that's decent. Like, depending on how, how useful that gauge is, it's it's like somewhere up here. You know, if Beheaded that ha had that, he'd be insanely good. But uh, we're probably not going to see that much gauge, like that much value out of gauge. Because keep in mind, when it comes to gauge economy and exceed, a bit, there's, there's a few questions. One of them is, how easily do you get gauge? And the other is, how efficiently do you spend it? Because uh, Bison has all the gauge he wants, right? He prints the stuff. Uh, but everything he wants to do costs some gauge. And that's really important. So it's a lot of in and a lot of outs. Uh, similar story with Hakuman, by the way. Hakuman gets pretty much all the gauge he could ever want. Um, infinite gauge for Hakuman. But also, he needs it. <laughs> um, whereas a character like Beheaded wants every scrap of gauge he can get, has to work for it, and uh, actually is pretty conservative with it, right? Like, he spends two gauge at a time until he's about to kill you, or if he desperately needs that uh, wave of denial. Uh, or both. And then he spins phaser into super into you're, you're just annihilated now, which is usually like takes another, an, I think that takes like three gauge to do the combo properly and still be safe on the turn after. Um, but it's been a while since I've done that. I might be thinking of latest version actually. Uh, regardless. So Cyrus, this is a gauge in ability. So we're going to think about that as we look at this kit. Uh, oh, right, and also 6 exceed cost. Uh, that is a tip. In Season 2, a, an exceed cost of 6 or higher implies that the character is reliant on their transformations. Uh, so his transformations are going to be important. So I guess we'll actually look at his transformation cards next. Uh, Alright, well, here we go. I'll just dial in. 2 to 5, 5, 3, 3 guard, ignore guard, hit retreat 2, draw a card. Uh, this is a mid speed fireball. Beats low fireballs because it ignores guard. Loses to some fast fireballs because it has three guard. Not all fast fireballs. It's a little flimsy as a mid speed, but it also draws a card and gains more distance. This is this is solid. Also, having him in range of two means that it is actually like viable in the normal interactions in a lot of situations. So this is a good card. Um, let's see. Um, oh, hello. Uh, SK Muffin. Uh, well, if you'd like to play, you'd be welcome to play uh, after after I do this. Um, I'm I'm still up, but yeah. So let's let's. So this is a mid speed fireball. Um, it's not guaranteed to hit, right? Like that's by the nature of mid speeds, but it's pretty decent. It's reasonably reliable. Uh, if you can get the opponents back to the wall and be at range five, then it's probably extremely safe against most characters. So it's good. Uh, and it gets a lot of value on hits. Now, with this transformation, you may play instant boost from your gauge as though they're in your hand. When you do seal them after they resolve, uh, you can play instant boost from your gauge. Your instant boost go into your gauge. You can play instant boost twice without having to reshuffle. Uh, that's really good. So, this combined with your character ability is a natural engine in and of itself, right? Like, this is a two card engine that says reading assault reading is a thing that I can just do. You know, I start at range 3, I play reading from hands, I name Spike, I play Assault from hands. If the first reading doesn't catch Spike, well, I'm still on curve. So I hit you, I gain advantage, focus goes to my gauge, and also I get to see your hands. Now I play reading from my gauge, name something that is in your hands, 
and you know beat it like the, the, you have options oh you can't play it as open sorry to hear it um if you if you ever have the ability to um and you're on the Lorraine discord then obviously feel free to ask for games uh i'm always happy to play this when i can uh and i love teaching folks if you aren't versed in it yourself um I, I'm not sure if you are or aren't. Your name looks familiar, but I'm afraid I don't recall if we've met. Anyway. Back to this thing. I did. I apologize. I'm very bad with names. Uh, Siren Call. 5644. Uh, guard. Yeah, so this is an interesting fireball shape because this is not really a fast, not really a slow, not really a mid speed. It's a little bit of everything. Um. It's the only thing it isn't a good at being is a mid speed, but it's basically the, a standard fireball shape, but a good standard fireball shape. It trades with fast things, it trades with slow things. Uh, it will often beat mid speeds or sometimes lose them depending on the mid speed. Um, yeah, this this is just a good card, very reliable, like projectile. Th this says you are going to be in the projectile range and you're comfortable with that. Uh, after is kind of interesting because this definitely feels like a back uh, a, a, a drawback um, because like what this card tells you is you want to be in fireball range and then the after effect pulls pulls the opponent in so curious we'll, we'll, how, how good he's arranged it we'll see how the rest of the kit shapes up and then opulence your tax of hit if you're going to continue to play with some power well remember this so if you play a boost, you get plus one power. Uh, that does not stack, mind you, but that's clearly really good. Whether it's more or less useful than Memories of the Deep. Memories of the Deep is utility. Very good utility, especially because of reading. Um, but in terms of like consistent value, op Opulence just seems like it's gonna be very free value all the time. Especially mine with character ability. Character ability remains the linchpin, by the way. I'm actually going to knock that up a notch and just put these in the same level. Because um, character ability is what makes these super consistent. Uh, Alright. Iron of the Winds. 2 to 5, 3 to 5. After you may return a card, you just cross your hands. Uh, one of the earlier recurring fireballs. Not the earliest. That would be season 1. Uh, but this is, this is interesting because Iron of the Winds recurs in a very turn inefficient way. And it only recurs if you don't transform one copy. Um, you, you have to get a copy into your discard pile in order to be able to recur it, and you use the other copy to recur it. So, yeah. But yeah, it's a fast fireball shape. Very, very standard as far as that goes. It's just 2 to 5, 3, 5. Um, doesn't have any other weird interactions. So, it's good. You know, it, it, a lot like that last one, right? It's just like, okay, you are a character with projectiles. You will be in a projectile range. And we want to make sure that you're very, very functional there, so you're going to have multiple projectile options. So he has a fast, a mid-speed, and a good-at-everything projectile right now. Um, Reckless Greed. Once per turn after resolving an action that doesn't go to strike, you may discard one of your boosts from play to strike. Uh, clearly excellent. Um, especially because your character ability means that it specifically interacts with instant boosts. Right? So you can run, advance up three, that is, and then discard that to strike uh which is just really really good like that makes you very very flexible uh well, well sorry run is probably a bad example you can backstep and strike right you can go all right we're at range we're at range one or two let's be at range five and i'm striking uh that's very very scary um how much value do i think he gets out of this as opposed to the other things though after resolving an action that was going to strike well you can parry in the assaults but Quick Glance tells us there's no other advantage gain. Um, it's mostly just mobility, right? Like, this just gives you a lot of mobility. And an interesting thing about, like, a character with dedicated ranges that we're seeing right now, right? This, this is a ranged character, 2 to 5, 3 to 6, 2 to 5. Um, we'll see how these things shape that. But this is a character who's comfortable in projectile range. Having this much mobility, uh, where you can run and strike, backstep and strike, um, that's good, but it's also kind of predictable. And a character like this is usually going to end up backed into a corner. Like that is that is the way of keep away. If you're playing against a keep away character, then usually you're going to be hugging the center, and they will be near the wall. 
if you are a keep away character, you're going to have your back to the wall and you'll need to find a way to get out. Um, so, this is definitely good, but I'm not sure it's going to provide as much consistent value as these. Just because this basically says plus one power for the rest of the game. Um, and this is potentially absurdly punishing. But I might be hyper fixating and reading there. Um, notably, we are not seeing good range one options yet. And if we don't see good range one options, then that focus gets more and more important, even if reading is also really good. So I think my inclination is like to put it a little lower than these. Um, in terms of the attack, and, I, and I'm like I'm very heavily influenced right now by the transformations because it feels like he really, really wants them. Which is supported by the ability, right? That was a, that was our hint. Siren Call as an attack, I think, is definitely lower value than either of these. But I think Siren Call as a transformation is excellent. Um, yeah, Arya is clearly good. But I think I value this transformation more and then this attack much more. Alright, what do we got? Tidal World. 2, 3, 3, 6, hit, push, pull, 1. Uh, this is actually like a kind of iconic shape these days. People talk about title whirls. They're very uncommon, but that's what makes them notable. Right, so like Hazma has a title whirl. Um, it is a 2, 3, 3, 6, hit, push up to 1 and gain advantage. This is a card that at range 3 doesn't realistically lose to anything. Um, obviously, it can lose to things, right? It can lose to, for example, a low tiger shot. Uh, uh, well, sorry, this card can't. Hazma can uh, it can lose to Albatross Town, right? Like, at range 3, you push or pull 1, but you're still getting hit. Like, a, a card that is 2-4 to four with guard is what beats title, title World at range 3. Uh, also Eyes, which are the speed 7, one, range 1-3 one, guards. But Eyes might be more common than Title World, but uh, eh, it's close. At any rate... This card is very, very safe, just also kind of low value. Uh, it's it's huge, huge value here, of course, is that it is a speed 6 card that hits range 2 and 3. So at range 2, you can initiate very, very lively. And actually, because of who this character is so far, uh, you can respond at range 2 pretty reliably. Because at range 2, the opponent's not likely to play cross. Because if they do, then they end up farther away, and that is a win for you. Uh, at range 3, they are likely to play assault, or spike, or sweep. And then you beat all of those options with Tidal Whirl. So they're going to be nervous to initiate at range 3. Which is very good for you. So yeah, keeping people at bay at range 3 is, is very big. Uh, this is notably important because... Let me just demonstrate this. Oh, excuse me, I'm using that. Uh, let's use a different board. Right, so... You know, you're, you're some dude. He's the, he's the keep away. He's always moving away from you. You finally chase him to the corner. Range 3 is an interesting range because, excuse me, if you are at range 3, then no matter how far away he moves from you, he can't get more than two spaces away. Right? Or two spaces farther away. And you can make that distance up in a heartbeat. So, like, 3 is particularly a range where it's just nearly impossible for somebody to get a meaningful distance out. Because even Tager can move two spaces in a turn, right? Like, that's just not a thing that's hard to do. Um, if you go to range two, then they can potentially get to range six. You know, again, this is like spending a million resources potentially, but looking at the extreme cases, at range two, you're more threatening probably, but if they have the tools to get out of there, then they're going to be able to get farther away, and that's important. Uh, you, this is also why you will see a lot of people are not going to pin you at range 1 unless they are they have a strike ready or they just struck. Because if you're in this situation, well, now you can run, the boost turn cross, or just take a move action, and very easily get farther away than you were. Because that's the that's the deciding question here is like, when you, when you, the Cyrus player, take a turn to do something, does your end position change relative to your current position? So like you go, alright, we're at range 3, I spend 3, 4, 5, 6 force, we're at range 3. That's not great. But I have room to retreat now, so it is like technically better. Range 3, 
One, two, three, four, five, six. And now we're range four. That is a lot better. You know, that that went that number went up. And then same story here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I went from range one to range five. So in order to prevent you from getting out that easily, the heavy in the matchup, the somebody the person who isn't the keep away, will tend to favor sticking to the middle three spaces, which means you're often gonna be at range three. And that's my dissertation on why Tyler World is important. As an attack shape, it's very, very solid, and it does an incredibly useful job. Although it's not very impressive. Um, so, like, it doesn't have a high payout, but I think its existence is really, really important to him. So I'm going to put that right up there. Uh, all right. What have we got now? Treasure Hunter. One, two, five, four. Hit push three on the opponent. Discards gauge. At the top card, you discard positive gauge. Uh, so this is modeling theft, right? Like, instead of the add a card from the opponent's gauge to yours, in order to avoid changing hands between cards, like, in order to avoid cards changing players, uh, this just says the opponent discards a gauge and you, you get a gauge. So, like, it thematically is you're, you're stealing something, but doesn't have to steal cards to do it. Um, push three, obviously good, based on everything we've seen so far. Right, like this doesn't work at range four greater, but these all do. And this being worth an extra net two gauge is hilariously good. So this card is funny, right? It's your range one spike. Um, typically, your range one spike needs to be focus and sweep, if not block. Ideally, all three. Uh, this beats only sweep. However, I would actually say. Uh, this card, if you land this into sweep, focus, or block, you are winning the strike. Uh, because you're getting two gauge, the opponent is losing a gauge, and you're still trading. Um, if you land into sweep, you win because you push them out of range. Uh, block, you get all those things. You push them out of range, you get the gauge, they lose a the gauge. It's wonderful. So I think it definitely beats block, and it certainly beats sweep. Whether you land into, whether landing into focus is good for you or not is harder to say, but at some point, they're going to play focus because you need them not at range one. So when you go to range one, they're going to expect a treasure hunter or a grasp and play focus. That's life. Um, I think this is good as a threat. I think it's useful as an attack. I think it's mostly just going to kind of be a source of economy, though. I think it will consistently trade down. I think it will seldom actually beat things. Uh, certainly nice to have, though. Treasure Hoarder, add a card from your hand to your gauge. I mean, sure. Th this is fine. This is, I guess, a way to stockpile... No, that doesn't make sense. No, no, it, it does, actually, it does. So this adds a card from your hand to gauge, bypassing the hit effect on your character ability, right? So, if you want to save something for later, or have something in your gauge that you can pull on at a moment's notice without having to keep it in your hand, yeah, this, this reinforces the play pattern of using your gauge as a stockpile for resources, uh, which seems to be a, a, a trend here. That's pretty cool. I don't think it seats a lot of power budget. The attack is actually, like, decently powerful, but I don't feel like he's going to be able to use it all that often, uh, and I think people are going to naturally play things that beat it fairly often as well. Uh, mostly it's the sweet killer. But yeah, like, it also only works at range 1, so I guess having a range 1 option is good, but ideally you never want to play it. Uh, sorry, it works at range 2. I shouldn't say it doesn't work at range 2. But at range 2, look what else you could be doing. Well, mostly this. Mostly this. Because uh, this, this also beats focus and sweep and arguably block. Um, but yeah. Oh, actually, it is worth noting this is a push as opposed to a retreat. So it's going to be a little more useful than Albatross Talon a lot of the time because, like I, said, like I said before, you will end up with your back to the wall. So having a push is good. Still, I don't think it's I don't think it's quite up there with these. Uh, Dredge Fury. All right, this is an exciting card. Three to six, two four. So very mediocre standard projectile shape. Then before spent a three gauge, free trade spent plus two power. But instead of discarding one of the cards you spent, add it to your hands. So you get to spend two gauge. And then a third, oh, sorry, you spend a gauge that goes to your hands, and then ups two more. Uh, 
sorry. What, need water. Um, we're up to eight power. Two, four, six, plus two. Yeah, no, that's eight. That's good. That's great. This is actually really, really, like, this is a very strong projectile. Not least because it's only a one-gauge projectile in the first place. This is a before effect. This is not a four-gauge ultra, where if it fails, you are out for gauge. This is an ultra that is one gauge investment, and then if it fails, you're only out one gauge. You didn't have to pay the extra three. Uh, also, that little piece of recursion is pretty solid and I think relevant, um, letting you replay uh, instant boosts or relevant attacks or uh, continuous boosts. Like this, this into this to return, Aria to return, Aria to return. You know, Dredge Fury. Like, at some point, that loop has to take a turn off, but being able to recur stuff is pretty cool. Alright. The boost, Riptide. This is tremendously fun. I love losing games with Riptide. Um, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad boost. Uh, in fact, it's an excellent boost. Uh, it's just very easy to be greedy with it. And I love being greedy, so I do it all the time. Both players drop to three cards to take another action. This is a great example of a symmetrical effect that is not symmetrical. Um, not as good as the other example, but still pretty good. From earlier in the stream, that is. So, you drop to three, then your opponent draws up to three, then you take another action. But note also, hey, uh, there it is, sorry. Turns into a face down continuous boost, which is plus one power. And by the way, you can now take another action, and if that action doesn't cause a strike, you can then discard this boost to strike. Um, so, you have a lot of tools, a lot of options, a lot of things you can do with this. Your XD mode even gets better, but I'll come to that later. I haven't talked about that yet, because... Honestly, because it's the last thing I learned about Cyrus. <laughs> um, this is great. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very commonly used to bait the opponent into drawing a bunch of cards to improve the chances of a reading going off successfully especially relevant because you'll often have a focus engage uh, that you can use to threaten a reading forever, which can cause the opponent to just let you have value, right? If you go, all right, how many, I'm drawing three, how many do you want? And they go, uh, zero, because they're nervous. That's basically free value for you, and that's fantastic. Relative to everything else, though, this feels like the capstone. Uh, not really, like, the boost feels like it's a central piece of the engine. The attack feels like it's the, the finishing blow. I think I put this on Arya's here for how important it is and how much power budget it eats. Um, well, no, I think the boost moves it up a tier, honestly. Like, I think that boost is as important slash valuable slash powerful as one of these transformations. Specifically because of how it interacts with his other abilities. Um, Alright, 17 to deep. 1 to 2 to 7. Uh, this is a DP. Uh, that is to say, a Dragon Punch or sure you can. It is an above curve range two option. Well, it's an above curve option, and then we usually refer to the one or two speed seven option as uh, a DP. Um, invincible reversals in fighting games are things where basically you are invincible, meaning you just ignore the opponent's attack and do your thing. Uh, and they're, they're reversals because you do them when the opponent has already started doing their move. Like, it turns the tables on them. Um, but yeah, the important part of, of a DP is it's it's designed to be a defensive shape because you can play it in a, at, a, at a point where it's above curve. There's a slight flaw with that with Symphony of the Deep. Symphony of the Deep is above curve at range 2. Uh, at range 2, that does mean you can basically guarantee that it hits, but the main thing that is on curve you'd worry about is cross. And I think it's pretty clear people aren't likely to cross against Cyrus. Uh... So it doesn't do great. The main value is just that you can guarantee that you're hitting. It, which, because of your ability, is super useful. Uh, and also this hit effect here. Return cards at random from your discard pile to your hand, so you have seven hands. So you get seven random cards from your discard pile, which are effect not seven, sorry. Up to seven. Probably fewer than seven. Uh, and they are th they're effectively revealed, because discard piles are known, right? So like... Your opponent looks at your discard pile, then you return cards from it, and then they look at your discard pile again, and then I'll, I'll do what the cards were. Um, but even with that drawback, like, especially if this is used defensively, 
then you have you can get rid of normals on your turn. Um, yeah, that's that's a great hit effect. The only question is how much value you can get out of it, and then how much life are you going to lose by playing it? Because this is a two gauge ultra, um, and it does not do much damage. It's just not going to stun things. But very very useful hit effect. It's a lot like with the uh, the range one, um, range one speed seven power two specials that show up throughout seventh cross as like yeah you're gonna lose the strike but but you're gonna get something that you want something that you need and i'm not even actually sure he needs this but i think he likes it like i think this is a very good way to recur tools without stealing them using this thing wait sorry yeah yeah this thing yeah that's the one um hmm yeah it's interesting all right, uh, Silver Shadow moves to any space or range from the opponent. Okay, well, based on the whole thing from earlier, right, you should realize how important that is. This is a, I'm on this side, or I'm out of the corner, and now I have room to backstep, or play cross, or play tidal world, or whatever. Uh, oh yeah, in particular, this means if I'm set up, right, then I can move to range three, turn it into a boost, discard the boost, play tidal world, the opponent's at range four. I'm very, very happy. So, yeah, so I think this is definitely good. I think this one, I would say, falls into Aria tools, where it's it's good, it's useful, does a lot, does a job, doesn't do anything phenomenally well, though. Um, yeah, Reckless Greed seems to really, really combo well with uh, several of these. Oh, I didn't even talk about the boost of Tidal Whirl. Uh, obviously good, combos well with everything. Cool, next. Uh, XC mode. When you exceed add your continuous boost your gauge. Um, the reason for that is actually not really a power level thing. Uh, I'll explain in a moment. After resolving an instant boost, put it into play as a face on continuous boost, reach plus one power, and then move up to one. Alright, here, here's the thing. On front side, uh, you, being Cyrus, say, I'm going to play... No. There you go. Uh, run. Advance for three. So you do. You advance two. Alright, time passes. Now it's back to you and you go, alright, I'm I've got my gauge and my transforms and whatever, and I'm gonna exceed. And now it's the end of your turn, and the next turn you go, alright, I'm gonna play uh backstab. Retreat up to four. And then it turns into a face down boost that says plus one power, and now move up to one. And now I have two face down boosts that have different text. And the text on this one. Uh, I have to remember from the front side, which is no longer in play, but it was given that text when it put in, when it was put into play. Uh, this is confusing. This is hard to track. This is easy to lose track of. So, when you exceed on your continuous boost your gauge, just so you don't have to track them anymore. Like, that is essentially the reason that this exists, is my impression, and it's a good design decision. Um, it means you don't have two different face-down continuous boosts with different texts, one of which the text is, like, the reference for the text is on a face of the card that is no longer visible, because that's obnoxious. Alright, uh, as for the actual effect of this ability, um, similar to front side, but instead of hit at the stage, it is plus one power and now move up to one. Plus one power on that boost, meaning each time you do this, you have a plus one power boost in play. So your instant boosts convert into power boosts instead of into gauge boosts. Uh, it also has now move up to one, which is clearly pretty good, because this allows you to do stuff like... Uh, hey soul, you have a known, you know, block or something, and you are you know that you're safe because we're at range one. Reading block. Uh, set my attack. This is now resolved. Flip, retreat, get spiked for, you know, five plus one damage. Like, and that's that's just the most basic of plays. Um, so this this gives you a ton of potential. Front side clearly is like, you have an engine, this sets up your engine, this makes everything work, it ties everything together, and then your XC mode is, okay, done playing with your engine? Cool. Uh, murder the opponent. You're, 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 you're good to just unleash actual raw power now. But it definitely feels like to get full value out of this, you need to have this boost plus this transform uh, and 
ideally this, because this means you get plus two power off of the first one. So like, you can pretty trivially do a one boost combo turn, but getting more than one, you have to have this. And then ideally this. So it requires much more setup, very obviously, because this is the thing that helps you set up. And then this is the thing that lets you capitalize on the setup. But a 16 mode is excellent. Um, it is also the thing that lets you close games of Cyrus because he he has okay power, but like this is expensive, and also you want to play the boost a lot. Three, two, three, four. Not at all reliable. Not very reliable. His power is okay, but it's not very good. Um, this this transformation and this ability are are where he's getting his lethal from. Otherwise, other than that, he's just trying to keep you away so that he has time to actually build up to it. Yeah, I think his exceed ability is as important as his character ability. It just is employed in different situations. Uh, so that's my rating of Cyrus. I think Tidal Roll is the most important attack in his kit because of the role it plays as a defensive tool. I think this boost is an incredibly important boost, but it's only important because of how it interacts with his transformations and, you know, exceed and character abilities and such. Um, and of his transformations, although this one is the one that, again, like, turns all of your setup into, I'm now finally doing anything that matters, I think these two are the, uh, the more foundational transformations. And then this is just a good tool. And then this is just a bad tool that, like, is incredibly good if it works. And this boost exists, I guess, but it is not interesting at all, so, meh. Alright, that's my Cyrus power button.